Okay, so today um, <clears throat> we're going to continue our track through uh, the book of Acts. Um, I promised way back at the beginning that we'll take some, some other directions, and eventually we will. Uh, we've been in this for a few months now, and we're already uh, almost to the end of chapter 8. We'll conclude chapter 8 today, which is really pretty good progress considering everything that we've covered. And today in particular, we want to look at Philip's story, the second part of Philip's story, and uh, Philip becomes known as an evangelist, and that's not necessarily a word we like, it's like uh, evangelism, gospeling the gospel, heralding the good news to those that need to hear it, and oh, how we love to hate the idea of having to share our faith in Jesus with somebody. It should be a joy, but somehow, with the best news ever shared with all of mankind, we're afraid, and there's no reason whatsoever. It should be a joy, and that was Philip's joy, to share the gospel wherever he found himself. And because we struggle with that a little bit, I think we need to talk about that today. And there's, um, you know, some may argue this, but for where we are in the book of Acts, there's probably no better person in the whole book, at, up to this point anyway, better than Philip to follow uh, as he shares the gospel wherever he goes. So I want to work through the text today, Acts 8, 26 through 40, and then at the end revisit it with some application. So today is a continuation of Philip's story. If you remember, he's one of the seven uh, chosen to um, take care of widows, and he is the second of three guys that Luke uses to show how the gospel story, the good news of Jesus, made its way out of Jerusalem, um, out of the context of strictly um, Judaism and the Jews, into phase two of the commission that Jesus gives in Acts 1-8 to be his witnesses, empowered by the Spirit, to take the gospel, to preach the gospel in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and even to the uttermost parts of the world. Um, this is phase two. Luke uses these three guys to show Stephen, Philip, and then lastly Saul, Luke uses these guys to show how the gospel made it out. He's a historian. He's telling the story. He's making a case. There's, uh, you'd have to go back and listen to some of the earlier sermons, particularly when I was laying the foundation for the book, to understand why he's doing this. He's telling the story of Jesus for the whole world, but he may also be making an apologetic for Judaism, for Christianity, which is its logical conclusion the logical conclusion of Judaism, but maybe also he's making an argument for Paul, who is under arrest, and Luke is Paul's traveling companion, and uh, Luke is writing to a guy named Theophilus, and he says, let me tell you the whole story, and he starts back in Luke, and then he finishes it in the book of Acts. Here's what Jesus did, here's how he lived, how he died, how he was buried, how he rose again, how he appeared to his um, disciples after his resurrection, and he opened up the scriptures to them, and he told them the truth, and then they're to go to Jerusalem and wait, and they do, and Jesus shows up again, and he teaches them for 40 more days, and then he sends the Spirit on them to empower them to take the gospel. And here, what Luke does is he uses these three guys. Stephen, great guy, stands up to the Jewish officials, and they kill him. And persecution breaks loose. Philip, a Hellenized Jew, an out-of-towner who's come to town, 
full-fledged Jew, but also looked down upon by the local Jews, because he is an out-of-towner, he's Hellenized, he's been influenced by Greek culture, that's what Hellenized means. He leaves town, everybody leaves except the apostles. He leaves town and he ends up in Samaria. Some place a Jew should never go, but he preaches the gospel, does miracles. Everybody gets happy and gets saved. The apostles come down, lay hands on those Samaritans, symbolically saying, hey, we receive you. I mean, the gospel of Jesus is bigger than any division that has ever existed between us. We recognize this, and when the apostles lay hands on them, they're filled with the Spirit, with some sort of evidence that a sorcerer wants to buy so it's probably speaking in tongues. That's the only evidence we ever see initially of being filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts. So when Simon, the sorcerer, sees it, hey, can I buy that? Peter, who's there at the time, rebukes him along with John. They rebuke him and, you know, basically say, you're in big trouble, buddy. And uh, then they go home, and, uh, but the Spirit leads Philip uh, in another direction. And so now the gospel's made it out of Jerusalem and it's made it to Samaria. And now it's going to get even weirder for a Jew who's lived basically their whole life in this cocoon of Judaism. But who better to go in this story than an outcast to an outcast? Philip, an outcast going to outcast. That seems to be his story. Preaching the good news about Jesus. He started out as a good man who waited tables, who made sure the needs of widows were met in the church and then by angelic divine intervention his plans changed and so did his direction. Because in evangelism in contrast to our plans, we just never know what God has in store. And the biggest part of evangelism, since we hate it so much, I just want you to know it, is just showing up. And sometimes that means our plans have to change because God's plans um, are bigger than ours and we don't understand them. And so we just go with the flow and that's what Philip did. So we started out with the story in Samaria. Now here's the rest of his story. He Started out heading north, but God changed his direction in contrast, and he was leading him to someone else. Verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Great revival. An angel shows up. And it's not like this hasn't happened before. From time to time in Scripture, it happens. But it probably took an angel, because when things are going well, God knows how to get our attention. And so, sometimes he has to do something miraculous like send an angel. And this angel he sends to Philip, who says to Philip, go south to the road. You know, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is an ancient Philistine city about 50 miles southwest of Jerusalem near the Mediterranean coast. Old Testament Gaza had been destroyed and uh, rebuilt nearby that same location uh, just about 120, 30 years before it was destroyed and then maybe 60 or 70, 80 years before it was rebuilt. And so the angel tells Philip to head down um, either the deserted road that goes to the old city or the road itself down to the city of Gaza, which um, basically is desolate. It's deserted. Go down this, leave the cities, leave the towns, leave all the people, and go out into the middle of nowhere. Now, why would he want to do that? I mean, you know, church growth experts are showing up and taking notes. He doesn't want to leave. So God sends an angel. And an angel directs him to go to this deserted place because sometimes our plans change when God gets involved. And surely, the place and timing seemed inappropriate. Why would God move Philip from an area-wide evangelistic campaign just getting underway in Samaria to leave town, to leave the crowds, to go down to a lonely desert back road to the end of the Palestinian world. And I think Luke wants us to see um, what the early Christians um, 
were like by telling us this story. I mean, in contrast to what we know, say, for instance, of Jonah. <laughs> when God speaks, he listens. This is what the church was like at its birth. When God speaks, the people immediately listen. And that's what Philip is exemplifying here. Unlike Jonah, like empowered by the Spirit then, Philip, the early church, they don't do their own thing or go their own way. They do what God commands them to do, and they do it immediately. Oh, if all of us in the church today would still do that. <laughs> usually we have to fight with God. We usually head the other direction because we know. I mean, I think of the story of Jonah, right? Uh, you remember the story. God tells him to go and preach at Nineveh. And they're the enemies of his people. He doesn't want to go preach to them. He's afraid that God is going to save them. <laughs> I don't like this deal, God. And he takes off and God has to arrest him and get him back to where he preaches. And he preaches and a citywide revival breaks out and he gets all upset at God. <laughs> not, not the early church. Not Philip. When God spoke, he listened and he went. Verse 27, so he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Philip thought he was on his way to Gaza, but Gaza wasn't the target at all. It was the Ethiopian eunuch. It was a person, an individual, an important official, a powerful, burnt-faced, that's what Ethiopian means, a powerful, burnt-faced black man, of large means. He was in charge of all of the treasury of the Candake. Older translations say Candace, and we think that that's a name, but this is a title. Candake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This is a dynastic title used by women rulers in Ethiopia of the day. Ethiopia... It's probably the Sudan, actually, today. That's most of the area. Maybe it includes some of Ethiopia, but it's really like the Nubian area within Sudan today. She is the female counterpart to people like the Pharaoh and Caesar. Powerful, powerful. And he is in her service. As a matter of fact, he's her treasurer. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. I mean, this is crazy. Which would mean that he was a convert to Judaism. But being a eunuch could have kept him from being a full convert, like they had stages. Some commentators say that because Luke uses both terms, a eunuch, and then he mentions a title, that of a treasurer, um, that he, like many, had been castrated, emasculated, and in royal service to the queen, which was standard operating procedure in ancient times. If you're going to be, if you're a man, and you're going to be in, the, in service of a harem or around the queen a lot, that's what they did. I mean, the line had to be protected at all costs. If this is the case, then the Ethiopian wouldn't have been um, granted um, full access, full participation in temple worship. He'd just been to Jerusalem to worship, but he couldn't go all the way in. He would have been what the Jews called a proselyte at the gate. In other words, complete access to the sanctuary was prohibited. He could only go so far, relegated to the outer court, he was an outsider too, you see, who had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Anyway, that's how committed he was. You remember the story and the layout of the temple with the Holy of Holies in the middle, the place of God's um, presence where Jews assume that he's taking up residence even though his, he does appear there um, it's limited and it's measured because can a house built by human hands contain the creator of the universe? 
Obviously not. In the center is the Holy of Holies, and then the holy place adjoining it. And then there are a series of courts where only the priests can go, where only Jewish men can go, where outsiders and women can go, all divided by walls that you're not allowed to cross. You'll profane worship. He traveled all that way only to be able to go so far, completely committed and yet still looked upon as an outsider. It's amazing. We still struggle with the same things today, even though Jesus has broken down every wall and made access to God utterly possible for every human being. He was an outsider who had gone to Jerusalem and worshiped. And now, verse 28, he's on his way home, and he's sitting in his chariot, and he's reading the book, a scroll of Isaiah the prophet, which is like completely awesome. Just recently, there was... I I need to stay on my notes. Just recently, though, within the last few years... They have discovered a scroll of Isaiah. I think it's about 50 feet long. You roll it out, something like that. I I need to go back and check my facts. Uh, Scrolls could only be so long, and then they'd have to start another scroll. They found a scroll of Isaiah, which is the earliest dated scroll of Isaiah. Um, And they've analyzed it, I guess, a few years back. They've known about it for a long time which was part of the collection at the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found there. And this predates any other Old Testament text, especially of Isaiah, by about 900 or 1,000 years. And when experts look at that copy, which predates all the other copies that we had at later dates, it matches up almost perfectly, demonstrating God's superintendence over his word to make sure that it's transmitted to us in all of its beauty and perfection, inerrant. There's no error found there. It can lead us to faith if we'll read it and we'll study it, and that's what this guy is doing. And he probably couldn't pick a better book than Isaiah to be studying, right? So he's driving along, heading home, and he's reading from the prophet Isaiah, and you have to wonder at this moment what Philip is thinking. Here I am in the middle of nowhere. What are the odds? I mean, things were going so well back in Samaria. Church growth experts were showing up and taking notes. No way. Um, I should be out here in the middle of nowhere and then run into this black man who is reading a Jewish scroll From their scriptures, Isaiah, no less, right? He doesn't know that quite yet. How could this be? I mean, the guy's got some bucks because those things cost a fortune. I mean, whole communities would pool their funds so that they could have one scroll of an Old Testament text to be read in their synagogue. This guy must have been well off to be able to, and I don't know how he got it, Some people suggest that while he was in Jerusalem, he bought it, and then on the way home, he's reading it, right? So all these things are going through Philip's mind. He knows he's rich. He's reading, which couldn't be better. Philip is caught up with his travels and trying to figure out what God is doing, and maybe he realizes, oh, great, my feet are hurting too. I'm walking down this road in the middle of nowhere, and about that time, verse 29, the spirit this time, not an angel, not that God wasn't directing, but the Spirit, which is big in Luke's vocabulary, the Spirit, not an angel, this time told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. (laughs) Maybe Philip was thinking, yeah, my feet are tired. A ride. (laughs) Nice. God, thanks. You're so good. But God, he's, He's way different. He starts to reason. He's way different than me. Wait. Maybe this is a divine appointment. You got me there for a minute, God. I thought I was going to Gaza. But man, he's way, he's way different than I am. Oh, well, he needs Jesus, right? Got it. You just never know. I'm glad the oxen are pulling this cart because if a horse was, there's no way. I wonder... When I get there, what I'm going to say. Isn't that the struggle that we all have? They're way different. I don't even know what to say. That's Philip right here. Of course, I read that into the text. (laughs) 
Not good exegesis, but I think it fits the context. He didn't know what to say. God is going to help him, though. There's going to be a conversation that comes up. Verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading out loud, which was how they did it back in that day, Isaiah the prophet. He's writing along. He's reading out loud from Isaiah. And Philip is probably like, ha, Isaiah, oh, man, this is perfect. I'm glad it's not Leviticus or Judges or something. And after listening for a minute, which is always good when you're gospeling the gospel, when you're sharing the good news of Jesus, he asks a great question, which is also good. Listen and ask questions instead of thinking that it's just your job to talk. He listened and he asked a great question. He said, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked, and the eunuch followed up with a great question of his own. I mean, this dude is so ready. It's unbelievable. And Luke demonstrates this throughout both volumes of his work, Luke and Acts, that Jesus is the key to understanding the Bible. In Luke 24, a stranger, and get this, so this is Luke writing the same stories. In Luke 24, a stranger shows up and opens up the scriptures to two disciples with a boatload of questions about what has just happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. And they're walking down a road. Different town they're headed to, but they're walking down a road. I mean, the scenario is very similar. It's not a mistake. Luke puts these things in here, hoping that the readers will pick up on what he's saying. And it took them a while, but after an invite to dinner, right, they got it. The stranger was the resurrected Jesus, and he was talking about the whole Old Testament, and how it all talked about him. Here is this guy, Lucas reporting. He's reading from Isaiah. And it's talking about Jesus in some of the most plain words that you can imagine of that day. Same scenario, except now instead of the resurrected Jesus, it's the spirit of the resurrected Jesus working in Philip to tell him what the Old Testament scriptures point to, who they point to, Jesus, the resurrected one. What a great opportunity. So here's another question. Great question by the eunuch. How can I, the eunuch said, understand unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. <gasps> nice rest on my feet, plus I get to share the gospel. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. And this is probably the best question ever, considering the passage that he's been reading. First century Jews debated the meaning of the suffering servant passages in Isaiah, and that's what this is, a suffering servant passage. You know it well. We're going to look at it in just a minute. They were unsure if Isaiah, the Jews of that day were unsure if Isaiah was talking about himself the nation of Israel, or the Messiah. And so this is the best invitation ever. It might be in the middle of nowhere, and we might be really different. But this guy is in need of God's grace. A serious searcher whose religion had not satisfied his quest for a Savior. Philip is probably thinking, this is too good. I get a ride for a while, and there's no better Old Testament text. Verse 32, and this is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. By the way, remember, Philip is a Hellenistic, a Greek Jew. This guy is a Hellenized individual who lives in Ethiopia, and he's reading, we know, <coughs> because of the text that has been transmitted to us down through the centuries that he's reading from a Greek version of the Old Testament. This is how the Greek reads, not the Hebrew, of the same passage from the Old Testament. And Luke, so interested and accurate as a historian, writes the Greek translation that he's reading from. He doesn't use the Hebrew, which is slightly different. It doesn't change the meaning any. But the wording is a little different. And experts know that this is from the Greek text. I mean, just perfection in history. And I love that about Luke. 
and about the whole story, and it demonstrates the truth of the story. A Greek going to a Greek, even though they're from different places, reading from a Greek text of the Hebrew Old Testament. And this is what he's reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Jesus is calling. Jesus on the main line, right? Tell him what you want. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. I mean, there is no better place to be reading in the Old Testament for a picture of Jesus than Isaiah. I mean, today he's known as the prince of prophets. His book is considered to be the gospel of the Old Testament. They didn't call it that then, but they knew it. And in this whole context, you read about his rejection, the rejection of the Messiah, his silence before his accusers, his death with wicked men, the, the substitutionary nature of his suffering. In other words, he died for you and me as a substitute. His burial in a rich man's grave and his ultimate vindication, his resurrection. And then the eunuch asked Philip, <clears throat> another great question. Please tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? You see, he's thinking right in line with all of the other religious folk of the day. And this is beautiful. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I mean, if there's a modern-day example, picture this. It would be like if you're waiting... Um, in the departure area of an airport and you're sitting next to a stranger who happens to have an open Bible sitting on his lap. He may not be reading out loud, but his finger is moving along the lines as he ponders the words and you glance over and you discover that he's reading from John chapter 3 and verse 16 is fast approaching. God prompts you to speak and to say something like, uh, not every day that you see somebody reading the Bible in an airport. John 3, great chapter. And the stranger then would turn to you and say, oh, it's interesting, but I'm stumped by this verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, what in the world does that mean? That's what this guy is saying in Philip's day, in Philip's time. I mean, could you handle it without a seminary degree? Could you open up the scriptures from that passage? You better be able to. And Philip could. So after you get over your shop, shock and you utter a few prayers of thanksgiving with enthusiasm, you delve into a simple explanation of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And in that day, this is the greatest text to use. And that's what Philip does, and it's an example to us. We don't have to let those opportunities go by. Philip knew the scriptures. So, here's my suggestion. Know the scriptures. So that when opportunities like this come up, you don't pass them by for fear or misunderstanding or shyness or because you hate witnessing. I had an evangelism class in college and one of the books that we had to read was entitled, I Hate Witnessing. <laughs> There's just something about it. I mean, we like fear the rejection, but if we would know the truth, the truth is they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting Christ. It's just up to us to take the message to them and let God do the work in them. And we think that's our job. No, we just know the scripture so when opportunities present themselves, we can open up the book. So oh, let me tell you what this means. I mean, I had an opportunity like this once in my lifetime. A new couple, older than me at the time, came to the church where Pam and I was serving. And they had questions. And they ran into another lady of the church who was always badgering guests <laughs> and trying to get at them saved before they left the church, whether they were saved or not. And I happened to be walking by after service, and she grabbed me, and she said, hey, this couple has some questions. 
And I, you know, I could tell that they were older and, you know, it's a little unusual for older people and they weren't that old. I wasn't that old then. And uh, not as old as now, that's for sure. So like, I stop and I talk to this couple and they say, yeah, we have some questions. And I'm thinking they have, you know, I'm prepared. Okay, so I tell you what we can do. Why don't we plan a time where we can sit down and talk about these things? And then I spent some more time talking to them and, and learning about them a little bit. And then a couple of days later, we actually sat down and we met. And so I said, okay, so you say so you have some questions and um, I hope that I can answer them and you're satisfied with those answers and that there's a good it, outcome from our meeting today. And of course, I'm skeptical, right? So they ask, start to ask questions and like an idiot, you know, I don't delve into some simple explanation of the gospel. I mean, I give them an explanation like I used to give our girls at Christmas time after I read the Christmas story. <laughs> I mean, they still want mom to do it all because dad just takes way too long. I know you feel the same. Shut up. <laughs> so I go into the spiel and I answer all their questions, I think. And they're kind of like this guy. Okay, we got all that. We just want to get saved. Da! You mean I just spent the last half hour explaining all this to you and the Holy Spirit had already done the work? Yes. It was like too good to be true. And that's Philip's experience here, even with somebody who was so different, with somebody that he could have been so apprehensive to approach. He went to him and he let the Spirit do the work. I mean, think about all of the things that had to happen for their lives to intersect at that very moment. And think about the fact that God does that with us every single day. And we are too busy. And Philip was busy in Samaria. And God had to get him out of there. He didn't understand it, but God had to get him out of there and get him alone so that he could not get him to Gaza, although that's part of the plan, but to get him to this guy, just one guy. And Philip is obedient, and then Philip is ready. He's got a text <laughs> right in front of him. And when you share the gospel, you hope for a conversion. And I'm sure that Philip is no different. So back to the story, verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. I mean, they're in the desert, but there's some water. <clears throat> I wasn't going to say this because I'm trying to conserve time, but can't constrain myself. We read right over this and don't think anything about it, even though this is how well we know the scriptures, right? We just read that he went into a desert or deserted place. We basically know, even, even if we haven't been there, the terrain of Israel, right? There's an old um, Hebrew adage that says when God was dispersing rocks all over the land of Israel, he assigned it to one clumsy angel who tripped over the threshold of heaven and spilled 90% of all of the rocks in the world in Israel. It's, some of it is rough, some of it's luscious, but some of it is rough, hard desert terrain. He's going south where that terrain exists. He's out in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden he runs into somebody who's different. He shares the gospel and all of a sudden there's water. Probably because this Ethiopian eunuch had been up in Jerusalem worshiping during the Passover where the lamb was slain that he was just reading about in Isaiah. He just experienced all of this because during Passover, that's the rainy season and the wadis, the little creek beds, they fill with water. And so they're traveling along probably in the spring and there's water. And so the, the eunuch then asked another question. Questions are great in evangelism. <clears throat> Tell me, please, uh, who is the prophet? He's gone through all that, and now he's at this place. They're traveling down the road, and they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized now that I know the truth about Jesus? And some manuscripts include what we would call verse 37. If you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, and then, so the eunuch answered this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Somewhere down the line, Luke didn't write this. Somewhere down the line, a scribe thought it was necessary for a profession of faith, so he added it. It doesn't add to or take away from the text. 
uh, it's obvious from the wording here that Luke uses. It's no mystery. The guy who had been denied full access to the faith up until this point has now heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ and has responded. And so he asks a rhetorical question. Look, here's water. What could stand in my way now of being baptized? I mean, didn't you just say that Jesus broke down every wall? I mean, we haven't even been introduced to Saul yet, who becomes known as Paul, who says in Ephesians, the middle wall of partition is broken down. Everybody, whether you're far away or close, has free access to God. Nothing is standing in my way, right? If the message is true, then I can be baptized. Philip obviously agreed. Verse 38, so he gave orders then to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Just as the eunuch had a visible sign to identify him, so baptism by immersion was the visible sign of his new identification with Christ. All the barriers were broken down in his identification with his new Christian community. A new community of believers that had developed out of a community that wanted to keep everybody away from God. Thinking that that was the most holy, righteous thing to do. Religion had overtaken them. And they forgot about the God who was so personal that you could call him Yahweh. But they wouldn't even say his name. It was too far away. Now God has visited this eunuch. Because one man was obedient to the call of God in evangelism. It wasn't Philip doing the work. It was the Holy Spirit doing the work through him. And notice, it involved questions and it involved the very word of God. And then it involved an act of obedience on the one who believed he was baptized, which is common. It's the first act of obedience commanded in Scripture. It doesn't produce salvation, but it does produce the evidence of salvation. It is a witness, a message to the onlookers in his entourage. Witnessing to the witnesses that were there that day, gospeling the gospel of the life and the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They saw it. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. <laughs> Removed, snatched him away. It's the same word that we use in Latin, um, translated rapture. I mean, it happened to Enoch, it happened to Elijah, it happened to Ezekiel, it happened to Paul. He writes about it in 2 Corinthians. And he writes about it, it's going to happen to the church on that day. God's people suddenly will be caught away. I'm not reading a miracle here, but apparently that's what happened. God snatched him away. Right in the middle of this baptism, the dude comes up out of the water and God takes the baptizer away because it's not about him. And the eunuch didn't see him anymore. He's probably like, what? But he went on his way, oh well, rejoicing, celebrating with joy in his heart at his newfound full acceptance into the faith community. He climbed back into his chariot and he headed home with the gospel story. We don't know for certain what happened, but that's what historians say happened. He took the gospel home to a whole new people because of the faithfulness of one individual. His story sort of stops there as far as history, real history is concerned, but Phillips continues. That's all the history, that's all we know of his story, the eunuch story, but there's a little more to know about Philip. His story continues. Verse 40 says, Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all of the towns until he reached Caesarea. So, after transporting Philip away from the Ethiopian eunuch, the Holy Spirit dropped him on his next job site, about 22 miles or so north of the city, uh, of north of Gaza in the city of Azotus, which is Ashdod, if you're reading about it in the Old Testament. And from there, Philip made his way north, uh, walking roughly another, I don't know, 60 miles or so up the coastal highway, the Via Maris, the coastal highway, the, the, the highway that runs by the sea. 
He works his way north all the way to Caesarea where it was either his home before or he settled down there because the next time we read about Philip in Luke's record, he appears about 20 years later. Paul and Luke visit him in Caesarea where there he has a house and four unmarried daughters who prophesy. He went back. Maybe that's where he was going when he left Jerusalem, when they were scattered like little seeds. He was heading north and he ended up in Samaria and then God totally changed his direction because he had one person that he needed to take the gospel to. But that didn't stop Philip. He worked his way all the way home and then he settled and that became the hub of his ministry. He becomes known there as the evangelist. Read the 21st um, chapter of the book of Acts. That's where we get the rest of his story. I mean, where do you think we get this story from? Who told Luke this story? Did you ever think of that? It was probably either um, Philip himself or one of his daughters. And I can, you know, imagine Philip telling the story. Like, yeah, I had big plans, man, there in Samaria. It was unreal. I mean, like the top dudes came down laying hands on people, whatnot. Revival was breaking out all over the place. I was preaching. Miracles were happening. People were getting healed. It was like the restorer. Remember last week? That's the Samaritan. That's the, the name of the Samaritan Messiah, the restorer. I mean, it was like they were being restored and God just poof, changed my direction, used an angel. The Holy Spirit came on the scene. I was baptizing this guy. And then all of a sudden, man, I, was, I don't know what happened. I mean, it was like Star Trek or something. And I was from there and I was over there and I just went home preaching everywhere I went. That's where Luke gets his story, probably right there. But that's also where we're invited into the story because that couldn't have been the end of Philip's story, just like the book of Acts doesn't have a formal ending. And it indicates to us that we're invited to join the story. And as we join the story, because we hate Oh, how we love to hate evangelizing. I just want to quickly, as I wrap this up, share just three more things as we revisit this story that you need to remember in today's context. First, God is interested in us as individuals. He loves large numbers. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. God loves crowds. But don't let that fool you for one minute. God loves individuals. He cares about individuals. He sent Philip to one guy. God knew that that guy would be traveling down a certain deserted road and that he would have a hunger for the truth. You may not, but God does. And he may send you to that individual. Even if that individual looks so unlikely a candidate to give their heart to the Lord, you never know what's going on inside that individual. And God is gravely concerned. He gave his one and only son so that even one person could be saved. That's the extent of his love. Who are we to disobey the command of God to share the gospel with even one person. If you're here today and you're an individual, I don't know what's going on in your heart. And generally, we don't know what's going on in people's hearts, not really deep down. If you need to give your heart to Jesus, today is the day. You've heard the gospel story in this message today. What else do you need? Just like the eunuch, maybe you've been searching and you've been reading and studying and contemplating and thinking, but you have no answers. Jesus is the answer. With Jesus, your life can make sense. You can understand why you're here and you're given a mission. <laughs> because, you know, it's not too long and you find out, hey, I thought this as an individual, I thought this was all about me. <laughs> no, it's about sharing the mission, uh, the message of Jesus with other individuals all along the path of your life. So if you're here today, in just a few minutes, you're going to have an opportunity to give your life 
to Jesus. Listen, if you run across people that may be different from you, let me ask you, will you tell them? Will you tell them after today? Will you tell them or will you be disobedient? Will you allow God to change your direction to reach out to just one person that maybe you think, ah, no way, but God has other plans. He changes our minds about things if we'll only submit to him and he gives us opportunities that we never anticipated. Secondly, from the story, we notice that position, power, and possessions can never satisfy the deep need of the soul. This guy had everything. He did have the money. He did have the power. He did have the position, and yet he traveled hundreds of miles to try to get to the place where he could just be a little closer to God. He couldn't get all the way there, but he couldn't buy it. I don't know what he did. Maybe he went out to eat with the elite in Judaism, but that didn't mean he was any closer to God. None of that stuff means anything in the end, you understand. It doesn't satisfy the longings of the human soul. Don't be fooled, brothers and sisters, by the enticements of the world. As nice as they may seem, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? The obvious answer is nothing. It would be to his or her loss. We need to be obedient. No matter what the social class of an individual, they're all hungry for something. They're all hungry for Jesus. It's just up to us to point that out, to open the scriptures. But we gotta know them first. Know the scriptures, share the scriptures. To anybody, not just people that you think look like need it. Not just people you think, oh, they'll probably just turn me down. Because rich people need Jesus too. Amen. Just like poor people. Sometimes it's a little harder to get through to the rich ones because they think they have it all, but that's the deceit of worldly riches. Number three, we learn that it took a willing and available layman, a regular church person. All this stuff is not my job. It's my job to empower you, to inform you, to take the gospel from in here to out there. That's the commission, right? To take what Jesus has done on the innermost part of who I am and share it with the outermost part of the world. That's our job. I train you to do that. I model that before you as best I can. And sometimes I fail, and sometimes you do too. We're all in this together. There's room for us to get better, and we need to do it because God just uses regular people. Surprise. Every pastor you ever met, every evangelist, just the regular people. That's all they are with a different call on their life. And we don't know the condition of a man's heart, but we know that every man, every woman needs Jesus. And so that brings me to the end. So if you would, stand with me. And um, I have to believe that um, there are people here that either need to give their heart to Jesus for the first time or they need to recommit their life to the Lord. And in a minute, I'm going to invite all of us to come forward. And I want those people to be included. Before we go back and eat chicken, we have some business to do. And if you feel as though you need to expand your horizons and take a different direction when it comes to sharing your faith, I want you to come up too. And that should be all of us because that's our mission as believers. Everybody in this room should be standing at this altar. I had those young guys move the communion table out of here because I wanted to invite all of you up to the front and then I want to pray for you. We'll get to the chicken. That's fine. You see, it only takes one person and you never know what God, you never know what God is doing in a person's heart. And you can't be shy. 
it's not you doing the work anyway. It's the Holy Spirit working. Come, come. If you need to recommit yourself to the Lord, if you need to, to give your life to Him for the first time, or you need to be a better witness for Him, come on down. And I want to pray for all of you. Some, of, some ladies, join us over here and pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'd love to say something to you right now. And for your Holy Spirit that empowers us to be your witnesses. Lord, forgive us our sins and forgive us our disobedience to you to share the gospel, to only go part way in and not experience you fully and the joy that we experience in your presence. So God, I pray that your spirit would invade our hearts we would be the witness that you've called us to be. That what you're doing here in the hearts of people for the first time wouldn't be contained. And for those recommitting, that it would be like it was something new and they would be rebaptized in the Spirit of Christ and become witnesses for Jesus. May we all be equipped to do the work of the ministry and to take what's in our hearts to those around us. Lord, bless your people. Make us witnesses for you. Sharing the unending love and the amazing grace of Christ with everyone that we come in contact with. Spirit, guide us and direct us. Lead us down the paths that will lead to people so that they'll come to know you. Make us all evangelists, regular church people who love Jesus, who have questions of our own, but know that the answer is found in Christ. May that be our testimony, and may that be our song. May Christ be our shield and our fortress. As long as life endures. A crazy, amazing grace is our song today. And may we share that with those around us. And do your people with power from on high to do the work of an evangelist, each one of us. As we recommit ourselves. Let us share the good news of the gospel that produces real dividends. Shinier than any silver or gold. Until we reach that place where we're in your presence holy. Where days never end and where we join in the heavenly choir and we recognize the amazing grace that God has given us that sets us free not just from worldly concerns but sets us free to share the gospel and to know the love of Jesus fresh and new and His mercy every day that His mercy would reign until that day feel your love here today. For some here today, let the change just drop off. 
right now in Jesus' name. Set them free. Jesus, you paid the price so that I could be saved. So flood us, Lord, with your mercy. Let it rain in our hearts. Let us feel again. Let us know again of your love and your grace. Fresh and new every day in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, bless your people. Bless their hearts. May their commitments today be real. And may we become obedient servants, just regular people, sharing Jesus loving each other more than we love chicken which I'm afraid that's where some of us are sometimes myself included bless your people bless our fellowship and Lord I'm not going to ask you to bless our lives I'm going to ask that we bless you as we go from this place today in Jesus name Amen.